national defense, size does matter. The greater your ability to project strength, the better prepared you are to defend your country and its interests. Imagine the responsibility of safeguarding your country's safety and stability over the oceans. For such a monumental task, you need not just any ship but an aircraft carrier. In the world of the U.S. Navy's mighty ships, two giants stand out, the supercarriers and the amphibious assault ships. The United States Navy has 11 nuclear-powered supercarriers, which are among its largest and most important assets for global military presence and international security. In addition to these titans, the Navy operates nine amphibious assault ships. Together, they form the foundation of the United States Navy's military capabilities on the seas. Today, we look at the exciting dynamics behind the Navy's dual force strategy. Why does the U.S. Navy operate two distinct types of carriers? Let's find out. By the way, if you are new here, don't forget to subscribe to never miss out on the latest uploads and updates. Now, let's start with a little history lesson. We promise to be quick. Imagine the world right after World War II, where naval battles and aircraft technology were rapidly evolving. Here starts the era of the supercarrier. The story begins in 1955 with the USS Forrestal, a game changer designed to handle bigger and more powerful aircraft than ever before. Fast forward to 1975, and the Nimitz-class carriers come into play, starting with the USS Nimitz. These nuclear carriers were built for endurance, becoming the backbone of U.S. naval dominance for years to come. Then in 2017, the USS Gerald R. Ford ushered in a new era of carrier technology with cutting-edge systems, pushing the limits of naval capability. The amphibious assault ships were developed almost in the same period. Post-World War II, the U.S. Navy rolled out the Iwo Jima-class LPH in the 1960s, specially designed ships focusing on helicopter operations. The 70s and 80s saw the introduction of Tarawa-class LHAs and WASP-class LHDs, revolutionizing marine deployment with well decks for landing craft. Then, in the 21st century, America-class LHAs took a bold step by enhancing air power capabilities, particularly adapting to operate the F-35B, striking a perfect balance between air dominance and amphibious flexibility. Let's now look at what sets each ship apart and why they're both vital to the Navy's mission, starting with their size. American supercarriers, particularly those of the Nimitz and Ford classes, tower at about 1,092 feet long. That's like lining up three football fields back to back. Meanwhile, amphibious assault ships such as those in the America and WASP classes are somewhat shorter at around 850 feet, though this can vary between different ship classes. Even though the length difference might not seem huge, it's crucial for understanding each ship's purpose. This distinction in size directly influences the capabilities of their decks. Amphibious assault ships, also known as LHDs or LHAs for landing helicopter dock and landing helicopter assault respectively, are versatile platforms. They're designed for aircraft that can perform vertical or short takeoffs and landings. Think of the F-35B Lightning II, AV-8B Harrier II, and MV-22 Osprey, alongside various helicopters. These ships are essentially mobile bases for short-range aircraft, crucial for quick troop deployment and support. In the middle of the Libyan Civil War in 2011, the USS Kearsarge, LHD-3, demonstrated the strategic importance of amphibious assault ships during Operation Odyssey Dawn. Tasked with a critical role in the multinational effort, the USS Kearsarge deployed AV-8B Harrier II jets and MV-22 Osprey aircraft to create a no-fly zone, safeguarding civilians from conflict. This operation showed amphibious assault ships' ability to project fearsome power and provide critical support in combat zones, as well as their operational versatility without the help of a supercarrier. On the other hand, the U.S. Navy's supercarriers, such as those of the Nimitz or Ford classes, serve as floating airports. Their extensive decks allow the launch of heavier airplanes like the F-18 Hornet and E-2 Hawkeye. These are designed for extensive patrol, intelligence gathering, and ground force support. This underlines the supercarrier's role in long-term missions. Just to give an idea, in the immediate aftermath of the September 11th attacks, supercarriers were swiftly deployed to the Arabian Sea, showcasing their strategic reach. The USS Enterprise, and later the USS Carl Vinson, played pivotal roles in launching precision airstrikes against Taliban and Al-Qaeda targets in Afghanistan. 
Their advanced capabilities and sheer size enabled them to serve as formidable, self-sustaining air bases at sea. Also, supercarriers such as the USS Abraham Lincoln were instrumental in the Iraq War's initial phases, launching air operations against Saddam Hussein's regime. The flexibility and endurance of supercarriers enabled a sustained aerial campaign, which was pivotal in the conflict's early success. When we think about the marvels of naval engineering, we see that there's more to these ships than meets the eye. Their design and capabilities are deeply influenced by their size. This is especially clear when comparing the massive supercarriers with the somewhat smaller amphibious assault ships, or LHDs. Though the difference in length, 340 feet, may appear slight, it dramatically affects their volume, and thus, every part of their mission. This phenomenon is thanks to a concept called the square cube law. In simple terms, as a ship grows in size, its volume increases much more than its surface area. This means a ship that's twice as long can carry eight times the volume. Why does this matter? Well, it means supercarriers can move through water more efficiently, carry more aircraft and supplies, and maintain longer deployments at sea, all because of their larger size. Their larger volume doesn't just mean supercarriers are big, it makes them surprisingly sleek in the water, moving more efficiently thanks to less resistance per volume. But remember, a ship's ability to glide smoothly through the ocean is determined by more than just its size. Everything from the design of her hull to the motors thundering in its belly contributes to that. And with their massive size comes a huge advantage. Supercarriers can carry an enormous amount of fuel, supplies, and ammunition. This means they can stay out at sea, ready for action without needing to head back to port for a long time. Imagine having enough supplies to sustain weeks of operations, about 375,000 cubic feet of ordnance to be exact, much more than the 16,000 cubic feet you'd find on an amphibious assault ship. This gap isn't just significant, it's massive, allowing supercarriers to remain in the thick of the action without interruption whereas an amphibious assault ship has a narrower range for its operations. The LHDs, while they may not match the sheer size and capacity of supercarriers, pack a punch with their versatile capabilities. Equipped with a well deck, these amphibious assault ships can host a variety of vehicles, be it three hovercrafts, up to 12 mechanized landing crafts, or as many as 40 amphibious assault vehicles, all customizable based on the mission's requirements. This capacity, combined with the ability to launch a variety of vertical takeoff and landing VTOL aircraft, makes LHDs particularly useful for rapid response missions that require both intense and brief operational timeframes. Despite their capacity to deploy VTOL aircraft and helicopters, LHD-class ships were not intended to serve primarily as traditional aircraft carriers. Their primary duty is amphibious warfare, these vessels are designed not just to dominate the skies, but to master amphibious warfare. Their main deck and well deck work in tandem to support marine operations, transporting troops directly to the heart of action. Whether it's a high-stakes assault or a humanitarian mission, LHDs are there to ensure marine expeditionary units MEUs, hit the ground running, fully supported from sea to shore. MEUs, often described as the military's rapid response force, rely on the unique capabilities of LHDs for a wide range of operations. For examples, the USS Bataan's response to the devastating earthquake in Haiti underscores the humanitarian potential of these vessels. Equipped with extensive medical facilities and the capacity to deliver large volumes of fresh water alongside Marines, aircraft, and landing craft, the USS Bataan provided critical aid and support, reaffirming the indispensable role of LHDs in disaster relief efforts. LHDs excel in nearshore, high-intensity operations of shorter duration. But their capabilities don't stop at the shoreline. These ships also navigate deeper waters, extending their operational reach far beyond coastal regions. Although operated by the Navy, with a sailor-dominated crew steering and maintaining the vessel, a significant part of the mission crew, sometimes over 2,700 individuals, comprises Marines from the Embarked Marine Expeditionary Unit. This includes pilots maneuvering aircraft like the F-35B Lightning II and MV-22 Osprey, vital for the ship's combat and support tasks. This collaboration transforms amphibious assault ships into seaborne marine bases, setting them apart from the supercarrier's role as expansive floating airfields. Owned and operated by the Navy, 
These vessels' strategic application and mission execution are deeply intertwined with Marine Corps expertise. This highlights the seamless union of Navy and Marine capabilities in power projection and amphibious warfare. Supercarriers and amphibious assault ships are built with a specific mission in mind. A supercarrier, a floating fortress, is never seen sailing alone. It is the centerpiece of a carrier strike group, or CSG, flanked by cruisers, destroyers, and at least one stealthy submarine. These warships work together to protect the carrier. Supercarriers are capable of carrying out underway replenishment, which allows them to stay at sea for extended periods of time without having to dock for supplies. This technique ensures that the carrier strike group's operational readiness and strategic mobility are maintained. In addition, the supercarrier serves as a floating command center, with an admiral on board coordinating the activities of the surrounding ships, emphasizing its importance as the focal point of naval power projection. On the other hand, LHDs, while capable of operating independently, are often key components of the amphibious ready groups, or ARG for short. An ARG typically consists of three ships, including an amphibious assault ship, a dock landing ship, or LSD, and an amphibious transport dock, or LPD, alongside a Marine Expeditionary Unit, or MEU, and provides a potent combination of air and sea power. This grouping is intended to project power and undertake a variety of military operations, ranging from amphibious assaults to humanitarian relief activities, while remaining self-sufficient for up to 15 days of continuous operations. While LHDs may dock at ports for resupply as part of their mission profile, they are also fully prepared for underway replenishment, ensuring they remain operational and self-sufficient for the duration of their missions, whether close to shore or in deeper waters. Traditionally, amphibious assault ships have been associated with deploying ground forces, while supercarriers are titans of air dominance. The debut of the America-class LHAs, however, is reshaping this dynamic, introducing a blend of capabilities that challenge traditional classifications. The introduction of the America-class LHAs into the U.S. Navy's arsenal not only represents a leap forward in amphibious assault capabilities, but also complements the formidable power of supercarriers. While supercarriers like the Nimitz and Ford classes dominate the world of sustained air dominance across the globe, America-class LHAs bring a unique set of capabilities that enhance the Navy's operational flexibility. One major innovation is the choice to forego the typical well deck, which is commonly utilized to launch landing craft. This design change was implemented to make way for an expanded aviation hangar, alongside increased storage for fuel and armaments. Such changes have transformed the America-class ships into ideal platforms for an impressive lineup of aircraft, like the F-35B Lightning II and MV-22 Osprey. These aircraft are at the cutting edge of military aviation technology, capable of vertical takeoff and landing, allowing them to operate in situations where quick, agile responses are required. This makes them particularly valuable in littoral regions, where their smaller size and specific design allow operations closer to shore and in areas less accessible to larger carriers. This design shift has earned the America class the nickname Lightning Carriers, highlighting their enhanced capability to project air power. The operational deployment of America class ships has vividly demonstrated their strategic value. For instance, the USS America LHA-6 has participated in multinational exercises and operations that underscore its role as a fast response platform capable of projecting US power and facilitating rapid troop deployment. These operations highlight how America-class LHAs can swiftly move into position, deliver critical air support, and enhance maritime security in conjunction with allied forces, showcasing their capability to adapt to a range of mission needs. This evolution begs the question, if amphibious assault ships are improving to better project air power, why keep a fleet of both LHAs and supercarriers? The solution resides in the complex details of military strategy. Much like selecting the right tool for a job, the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps choose their maritime platforms based on the mission at hand. Supercarriers, with construction costs above $13 billion and annual operational expenses reaching $1 billion, are the heavy hitters of sea-based air dominance designed for long-term, wide-ranging engagements. On the other hand, economically constructed LHAs and LHDs, with costs ranging from two to $3.4 billion, provide a diverse, cost-effective choice for a variety of jobs. 
When planning their naval strategy, the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps continue to look for innovative and cost-effective ways to improve force projection capabilities. A great example of this smart thinking is the creation of the America-class LHAs. These ships are a mix of two worlds. They have the quick movement and versatility of amphibious assault ships and the strong air power you usually see with the bigger supercarriers. This ensures that the correct asset is available for each specific mission, allowing the United States to stay agile and prepared across the whole spectrum of naval combat.